Mr. Gonclave. I don't know if I'm saying that correct. Is it Mr. Gonzalez? I hope you would pardon me for my error in the pronunciation pronunciation of your name. I'm going to try to stick to Steve, um, only because uh, I know I can pronounce that properly. <laughs> I wanted to address you or leave this video that maybe one day soon you would come across it. Um, this video is going to be highly critical of the prosecution. Uh, I'm going to explain and show to you what, what I've derived from the information released thus far, from statements made in written motions to statements made under oath, um, and the conclusions that, that I, I myself and many others draw from that, including uh, um, some, some very well, well-schooled attorneys uh, here on YouTube. So I'd like to go over the probable cause affidavit that was that was written, and then a sub, a, you know, connected to that was the uh, warrants for the arrest of Mr. Koberger. Um, I don't want this to come off as argumentative. I don't want this to come off in any way except this is the data that we have received thus far. I put it in just a few simple uh, points, bullet points. I will elaborate to some extent on them, but I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible because your pain is something I cannot comprehend. And I don't think hearing what I'm going to share with you is going to make you feel any better. Um, however, I think this perspective is valid. And I think the, and, and it, it's valid in as much as it can be verified. That's one. And the validity also comes from other people that have paid extremely close attention to the case that they refer to as the Idaho Four. Um, and so let, let me start with, with the first and this is going to address the PCA and these points um, that were used to get the warrants against Mr. Kohlberger. I do not know, I cannot say, and I will not talk about his guilt or innocence in any way, shape, or form. That's not for me to decide. Um, so the points that I'm going to, to share with you are going to be based on factually verifiable information that you yourself can find. So let's start with the original statement that Mr. Koberger turned off his phone. And, and let's be clear about this. Nobody knows if he turned off his phone. Nobody saw that. Nobody witnessed it. There's no way to verify that. Additionally, in the PCA, it makes room for that. It says he could have put it in airplane mode. It says it could have disconnected from the network. Okay. Those are important exculpatory statements. And because there is no way to show he physically turned that phone off, nobody can, can stand up and say that that happened unless Brian Kohlberger says he did. Then that particular statement in the PCA is a theory. There's no fact at all in there. And there's no way to verifiably produce a fact that he turned off his phone. Yet that was placed inside of a probable cause to arrest for multiple homicide. The officer that wrote that went on to tell us that his 13 years experience leads him to believe, uh, or he has knowledge that 13 years experience, he's, he's, he knows that criminals will often turn their phones off to mask their location while committing a crime. And I, and I can't argue that statement. I take that start, statement at the word of the officer, because it's completely sensible. But but let's back up now. Mr. Kohlberger has no history of a crime. He's not a criminal. He's a PhD student for criminology. Let's not forget who, who, who's been accused here. Not a prior criminal. Now, the argument that his teachings and the news media going after him, saying he went to school only for the purpose of learning how to commit this horrific, this horrific, um, crime is an opinion. There's no evidence to support that he went to school for this particular purpose. And factually, his criminal history being nil, um, why, why would you apply a criminal's behavior to Mr. Kohlberger? So let's, let's now move on to something else. We were told, and it was stated, that there were 12 prior trips of Mr. Kohlberger 
connecting to the area or to the cell tower that that, inc that includes um, 1122 Queen Road. I'm going to refer to it as Queen Road because that is correctly what that address is. 1122 Queen Road, which is off of King Road. Uh, I know people call it King, but I, I'm going to stick with what I, I, I know are a fact. It's, it's Queen Road. The 12 prior trips in a hearing uh, over um, interviewing the public, interviewing potential jurors, those 12 trips were confirmed by both the prosecution, the judge, not to have been related to stalking at all. Not to be related to stalking at all. And those 12 previous trips uh, to Moscow or to the tower that connects to the residence at 1122 Queen Road is the most accurate depiction of what they have. They have his cell phone connecting to a tower that spans it miles, but that tower also services 1122 Queen Road. So somewhere in that vicinity, his phone came up. And in no way, shape, or form, based on testimony and based on the arguments of the prosecutor, in no way, shape, or form are any of those 12 trips connected to stalking 1122 Queen Road and the uh, yeah, and the victims that, that we know exist. It's crazy. So that can be taken off the table. There's also a statement and a motion that's never been contradicted. There's zero ties to the victims, electronically or otherwise, between Mr. Kohlberger and any of the residents of the home uh, where your daughter resided or was visiting. I'm sorry, visiting, returning to visit. Also, it's been said that you released the Linda, Lo Linda Lane video. And this is an important point to make. It's probably a stunning point. But it was Brett Payne himself who confirmed what myself and several others, not many, but several others always contended, that the identity of the car in the vicinity of the crime scene was accurately described by the FBI examiner to be a 2011 to a 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Brett Payne confirmed that on the stand in his testimony that was just done the other day. So the Linda Lane footage does show a Hyundai Elantra, but the Hyundai Elantra is a 2011 to the 2013. And the picture that they claim from a video that shows a 14 to 16 Elantra has been stated to come from a, an Elantra came from uh, the, the wrong time going the wrong way. So I want you to be clear. So, so have to give this to you in a clear manner. The home where this scene took place, where this, anyway, I, I didn't want to refer to that because, I, again, I am so respectful and your pain is unimaginable to me. But the vehicle on Linda Lane, the vehicle and the movements described in the PCA that match that vehicle, that vehicle is 100% an 11 to 13 Hyundai Elantra and 100% cannot be Brian Koberger's vehicle. There was a gentleman out here, and I wish he would come back. His name is Get a Clue. He examined that video and the vehicle that ultimately drives around the building and purportedly parks is a Chrysler 300 that Elantre did not come back in. What you're seeing in the end of that video where a car comes up and goes around the building, that is a Chrysler 300, sir. That is not a Hyundai Elantra. It is not a 2011 Hyundai Elantra nor a 2014 to 2016 Elantra. It is in fact and get a clue video and analysis of this is unimpeachable. Uh, and when you combine that with the identity that's confirmed now by Brett Payne that the car near the crime scene was an 11 to 13, uh, that eliminates Brian Koberger as being present at that scene. At least through the means of his automobile, which folks, or, or sir, which, which Steve is being accused. He's, he's accused of driving his car there. That's part of the PCA. Everything comes down in the PCA to pings. And pictures, images, or video of an Elantra. There is not one solid piece of evidence that indicates Mr. Kohlberger was there. And, and I want to also point this out. All of these things that I'm sharing with you that were all entered into the PCA has been clearly stated by the prosecutor 
Brett, or, or what's his name? Uh, Bill Thompson and Judge Judge. Everything entered into the PCA and everything used to get the warrant did not include anything to do with IgG or DNA. There was no use of any form of any shape or of any identity of DNA used in the warrants that were issued to arrest Mr. Koberger and the subsequent warrants that were actually issued that that got his his buccal swab. So he was charged and in custody and and um, then warrants were issued to continue searching, to continue to try to close the loop on this case. Uh, there's no camera footage to show how he got to Linda Lane, as admitted yesterday. And I think it was admitted by Brett Payne. Also, during the course of this, this investigation, it's been told to us through motions through the defense and not been stopped. And they, and not even been objected to or even attempted to be counted. Um, that they did a search of everything Brian had come in contact, where he lived, where he worked, what he drove, including the parents' home, and that they found nothing from the victims connected to Brian Koberger. And they gave no explanation as to why. Now, these statements come from the defense attorney. These statements make two points. One, there's nothing there. Two, there's no sign of bleach or residue of any cleaning agent, which would indicate the suspect cleaned up after himself. Those are damning statements that have yet to be contradicted or even attempted to be addressed by the court or by the prosecution specifically. Additionally, and this is this is going to be hard, but but I, I want you to, to follow me here. The only reason we're having the current hearings that, that we're all able to witness and watch is because the prosecution refuses to turn over discovery. And because they're refusing to turn over discovery, these hearings now, and these pointed questions, and these questions are very, very important. If everything in the PCA is eliminated and cannot be supported by fact, then you have to ask yourself, are the warrants issued from this Accusatory instrument, are those warrants legal? There's many, many more points that I can make. But when you dissect the PCA that was used, the probable cause affidavit, and the application of a warrant, and the subsequent issuing of these warrants, and the subsequent issue of many more warrants to investigate Mr. Koberger, the one question that I've always had through all of this is, why didn't they do that before they arrested him? Why didn't they do the investigation? Why didn't they question him? Why didn't they do the things that they claimed they did with a hundred other people? Why did they not do that with Mr. Koberger? I find that to be irresponsible. I suspect that if you could show that there were, and, and let me be clear, I, I want to say this too, because I'm very offended by the prosecution, and as much as they had to have always known that those 12 previous trips had no connection to that home or the victims. They had to have known that. And I, I the minute they said he drove in similar, in similar areas 12 previous times, I knew right away that that meant he was nowhere near Queen Road. He took 12 similar trips into Moscow from June until November. How come those similar trips, how come the statement was he took 12, 12 similar trips and put him in, put him in the vicinity of the uh, murder scene or crime scene? Sorry for that word. Why, why, why isn't that in there? And that's because the prosecution always knew that that was part of a PCA that was part of the accusation, but, but it became unverifiable to support the, uh, the, the suggestion or the inference that Mr. Kohlberger was stalking. Yes, he made those trips. And yes, the prosecution always knew that they couldn't close the loop on showing him as a stalker. They always knew that. They always knew their pings were in question. And they always knew they had no single solid piece of evidence in the application of that warrant that made it likely Mr. Kohlberger did this act. 
nothing. There was not a single fact of evidence offered when they applied for that warrant to arrest him. Nothing. Everything they offered was supposition, theory, ideas, coulda, woulda, shoulda. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the loss of your daughter, but I'm sorry for what appears to be the loss of justice. How could the warrant have been issued with no investigation, with your experience as criminals turn off their phones, with your with your statement he could he turned off the his phone could have been turned off it could have lost the network connection it could have went in airplane mode for all we know the battery died we don't know and we're never probably going to know why his phone was was off and the fact that some guy's phone is off shouldn't be an issue for anybody the fact that he drove to that area 12 separate occasions even on the the night of the crime but none of those occasions based on their own statements similar trips based on what we heard in the testimony over these last few events. It wasn't Kohlberger. He didn't go to that property. He didn't go near that property 12 separate times. He didn't, he didn't have any connection to the victims on, on any electronic means or otherwise. They knew these things or had to know them relatively quickly. They then also came across there was no biological samples in any place Kohlberger could ever have been. The likelihood of that is just mind-boggling. The impossibility of that just seems stunning to me. How could that be if this gentleman did what he's accused of? Um, the camera footage is. Linda Lane confirmed to be an 11 to 13. I never, look at, when someone's a professional in their field, Steve, I never will question what you're telling me. I will go after I hear what you're saying. And look into it. Obviously, you you trust but verify, and that's how I I deal with facts. You trust what's being said, and then you look to verify. And in this particular situation, everything that was put in the PCA has become fully unverifiable. That's a stunning revelation. Stunning. My fear was always this: that Mr. Kohlberger committed these crimes but not in accordance with the accusations, not in accordance with the information they provided to get warrants against him. I have always said that the PCA is an exculpatory document for the defendant, that that PCA, and I, I said this a year ago, more than a year ago, when the information came out about the 12 trips, I said, there's Brian Koberger's alibi right there. That's exactly what he's going to say he did. And how many months went by from the time that was first disclosed to the public, where everybody devoured that as proven it stalked him. And how many months went by before Kohlberger said, yeah, that, yeah, that, I did all of that. And I'm telling you, Steve, the prosecution knows what I'm sharing with you. And if you pay very close attention to what Anne is looking for, she's not doing this to delay prosecution. She's not doing this because she wants to make some kind of plea deal with this guy. She's doing this because the evidence submitted to not only, let's be smart here, not only the arrest warrant and the subsequent investigative warrants is not just faulty, it's untrue. Untrue because it cannot be verified. And that information was then taken to avoid a preliminary hearing. The preliminary hearing is the step in the, in, in, in the process of, of a criminal proceeding to where the government can be questioned. Just be aware, a preliminary hearing is to question what the government is alleging and the documents they used to arrest you. And Bill ran around that with an indictment using, let be, let's be fair, using all the information that I've just shown you, they cannot verify. And if it is verified, it contradicts the narrative. He stalked them electronically. He was on uh, this social media site. Not true. How many times were we told his car was going to be a Petri dish? Not true. And, and I feel horrible to even be sharing this stuff with you. But I feel compelled that somebody needs to lay this out and make key crucial points that can be verified. And the prosecution needs to stand up. And they need to either show Mr. Mr. Kohlberger is unequivocally the man that committed this, this horrific crime against your daughter and her friends and friends of yours and your family, 
uh, or or the prosecution needs to get off the pot. Shit or get off the pot. Because he sits there like he's a bump on a log as Brett Payne tries to, to make sense of what he did. Apparently, he didn't do much. Apparently, there was no organization. Brett Payne is telling a, a defense attorney that the evidence she seeks is probably in the evidence room and he needs to go talk to that clerk. Well, could you imagine how our justice system would fare if defense attorneys had access to the evidence room? What kind of a cop is Brett Payne? What kind of a prosecutor is Bill Taylor or Thompson? Bill Thompson, I'm sorry. These things should have been confirmed in stone before you did anything with any kind of legal action against any American. Period. End of story. And that probable cause affidavit is, is almost a bad, it, it's a bad narrative. It's an unverifiable narrative. So if an 11 to 13 was what was on, was in that area, how did they say Brian Koberger parked his car and drove off at a high rate of speed? How did they say Brian Koberger went around that building? How do they make this allegation? When they already knew the car that was identified by the FBI agent was 11 to 13. And why is it the specific data, the specific video that Ann is asking for is specifically focused on that car? They did not give her the video that was used to conclude it was an 11 to 13 Hyundai Elantra. You see, that's what I mean. She's not asking for uh, moon dust. She's not asking to count the rings on Saturn. She's saying, okay, you identified an 11 to 13 Hyundai Elantra in the vicinity of the crime scene. Show me that video. It's a highly exculpatory for my client. She should have that video. I, I suspect that if you took the time to verify what I just shared with you, I suspect that you yourself, sir, would be having serious conversations with the prosecution. And you would want these answers clarified. And if they won't clarify them for you, then I suspect that it, that the verification of this has all been through the hearings. It's in the motions. It's in the counter motions. It's in, in, in <laughs> and I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. Everything Ann Taylor is seeking, the defendant is entitled to because it was part of the investigative process that resulted in allegations that charged him with four homicides and felony burglary. That's horrific. Those particular allegations are supported by investigative data. That data must be given to the defendant. There should be no if, ands, or buts, or maybe coulda, woulda, shouldas. That's how our system is designed to work. The judge's position in this has been very weak. The judge, whether he even knows it or not, his position is to protect the citizens from government overreach. That's the primary function of a judge. He weighs the laws. He weighs the information. And he makes decisions and makes decisions that will confine can, can the government to the limits within the Constitution. If you don't read them as rights, you got to let them go, Steve. But if you, in fact, do read them as rights, and all your investigative data that you've collected, that you used to get warrants and, and subpoenas, all of that is unverifiable. It can't be proven. Then you're walking down a path of oblivion. You have a case in front of you that it doesn't even, I, I suspect, that this will never make it to trial. I, there's just, to me, it, it makes no sense. You can't show me he turned off his phone. You can't show me he drove over to that house. You can't show me that he was at that house, but what you can show me is a different car was there. But you're alleging it was him in his car, and yet you had a video this whole time of the 11 to 13 Hyundai. You absolutely knew that that wasn't Kohlberger's car. And the car that goes around the building after the Elantra leaves is absolutely a Chrysler 300. It cannot be an Elantra. And it cannot be an Elantra, Steve, because the sail panel between the rear window on the, on the passenger door, the rear passenger door window and the rear window of the vehicle, that sail panel is about 16 or 18 inches wide on the car that rounds that building. And on an Elantra, it would be lucky to be three inches. The separation between the, the rear driver's side door window the utmost rear window of the vehicle is roughly three inches apart on an Elantra. Watch your own video, and when you get to the point of the car going around at roughly 407, slowly go frame by frame, and you will see the sail panel on that car is massive. It's five times the size of the Elantra. So the separation between the rear passenger window and the ultimate rear window of the vehicle is inconsistent 100% with the Hyundai Elantra. I do give credit to a guy called Get a Clue. 
he's a freak with stuff like this. And, uh, you know, I think he took his channel down, but, but he is a, an absolute smart guy. And, and when you look at what you're seeing on these, these testimonies, you have to ask yourself why my Mr. Uh, Bill isn't objecting, isn't offering, isn't questioning these people. How is it he doesn't question? It, it, it's shocking to me. And, and this is what I'm going to end with. What you're seeing here is a mini preliminary hearing that should not be happening. These particular hearings should not be happening. If not for the prosecution turning over discovery. If the prosecution had turned over this discovery, then this stuff would be, in, be, be, be getting put together for trial or, or off uh, uh, motions to suppress, which I think we're going to see a floodgate of motions to suppress, Steve, because the PCA is not a verifiable fact. It's an opinion that cannot be supported with any evidence. That's the basis under which they arrested Mr. Goldberger. Now, as I said in the beginning, I don't know if he did this. I don't know if he didn't do this. But what I can be freaking comfortable with is telling you what I've told you. As to his guilt or innocence, I leave that for others that have that, that, uh, that capacity to make that choice. I personally have no opinion on innocence or guilt, but I certainly have an opinion on process. And I certainly have an opinion uh, of being arrested with documents that you can't prove, statements that you made that are unverifiable. I have a big problem with that. And I think as Americans, we all should. And you as a parent, sir, my advice on the case is to be as objective as you can. And if what I'm sharing with you, go and verify it. And once you see this in black and white, you, sir, then I think should start questioning the state of Idaho. What is going on here? And, and let's not forget, they have a history of doing this with evidence when it comes to Stickergate, when it comes to uh, a chiropractor that was accused of killing a competitor, a competitor chiropractor, they withheld evidence and ran that guy through the dirt. There's many instances of this state and that area doing exactly what we're seeing here. They make accusations and these accusations become either unverifiable or provably wrong. And they withhold that evidence from the from the defense. There, this isn't wouldn't be the first time. It doesn't mean that the other times mean that the, those other times don't define what I'm pointing to you. What I'm pointing out is definable in and of itself. But what I want to point out is that they do have a history of that. Right. But that doesn't mean that that history includes every case. It doesn't even mean that that past history includes this case. In other words, I'm not just saying this because I know they did it before. I. I give them the benefit of the doubt like anybody else. This is a new case, a new crime, a new accusation, new documents. However, based on what we're seeing factually, this has a lot of reflections of previous work done by that, that particular state. Listen, I, I wish you and your family as much goodwill and, and, and love, all the compassion that I could possibly muster. I, I can, I have a 24 year old daughter. She, she, she did get through college, and uh, I I don't even know um, I don't even know how I could deal with this. I don't think I could. Um, but I think it only fair that you be addressed directly with this information, and that thou that you have it from me. Feel free to uh, reach out if you want. If not, that's fine. I'm not looking for fame. None of my streams have anything to do with making money. As a matter of fact, my streams you'll find on an unusually named network called Your Ass Hurts News Network, uh, my co-host Cletus, and we deal with the chaos that we see on the internet. We're, we're constantly going after the viewers uh, that follow these providers that tell these grandiose stories or misinformation. And so I have a stream based on that. It does also cover true crime. It does also cover some politics. Um, but I just felt like Sunday I woke up and I thought, you know, I think it might be the responsible thing to do to try to get a message to, to you. And uh, I hope this reaches you. I hope you're well. And uh, if you have listened to this, I, I want to thank you. And feel free to question me on any of the points I've made. I'll help go back. I'll help you get the information where it was written, where it was stated, where the documents, if you'd like to, or parts. Of, I'll, I'll rewatch every hearing again, if you would like. 
and bring out the parts where Mr. Payne is confirming that that car is an 11 to 13. Again, uh, my condolences, and uh, you have a good uh, a good Sunday.